Inner Voice. A heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Podcast. It is so great to be with you today. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain. I'm a psychotherapist, author, and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. Our heartfelt chat is about what matters most in our lives, our minds, our thoughts, feelings, behaviors, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. It is the holiday time and we want to create um, the best for ourselves and people around us. And this is a time that we can actually get good gifts. So I think that one of our latest book that is here, which is the Intentional Parenting with um, two of my colleagues, Dr. Nicole Jaffari and Dr. Eileen Manukian. Both of them are child development specialists, one in early child development and um, the other two, which is a professor in universities teaching child development. The three of us have gotten together and created this book, Intentional Parenting, A Practical Guide to Awareness Integration Theory. In this book, you will go through every chapter for different age groups, like infancy, toddler, child, um, when they go to school age, um, teen, preteen, and um, you know, early adolescent, and um, actually even um, older adolescent and young adults, because um, everybody needs to go through this conversation. This book is for parents, it's for grandparents, it's for uh, teachers and people who work with children of all these ages, and it takes you through the cognitive development, theoretical developments, uh, motor skills developments, what they need emotionally and emotional development, and through awareness integration, shares with you what are some of the things that you can do for your child to learn social skills and manage their emotion and know how to receive what they want in life in an appropriate way. Now, for all of you coaches and therapists, uh, the book, which is Awareness Integration Therapy, Clear the Past, um, Create a New Future, and a Fulfilled Life Now, takes you through the journey of um, nine principles and six phases of interventions of awareness integration therapy. And it really shares with you exactly how to work with your clients, whether you're a therapist or a coach. So these two books are great books for you to work um, and share and give it get as gifts to people you know or for yourself. It's a time to get yourself also great gifts. Now, in this episode, I am so excited to talk um, to Beverly Engel. She's an internationally recognized psychotherapist and an acclaimed advocate for victims of sexual abuse and emotional abuse. She's the author of numerous self-help books, including The Emotionally Abusive Relationship, Healing Your Emotional Self and It Wasn't Your Fault, Freeing Yourself from the Shame of Childhood Abuse with the Power of Self and Compassion. Um, Engel is a licensed marriage and family therapist and has been practicing psychotherapy for 35 years. Beverly's books have often been honored for various awards, including being a finalist in the Books of a Better Life Award. Many of her books have been chosen for various book clubs, including One Spirit Book Club, Psychology Today Book Club, Behavioral Science Book Clubs, and her books have been translated into many languages, including Japanese, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Greek, Turkish, and uh, Lithuanian. In addition to her professional work, Beverly frequently lends her expertise to national television talks. She has been appeared on uh, Oprah, CNN, Starting Over, and many other TV programs. She has a blog on Psychology Today website, as well as regularly contributing to Psychology Today magazine, has been featured in a number of newspapers and magazines, including Oprah Magazine, Cosmopolitan, um, Home Journal, uh, Chicago Tribune, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and um, Denver Post. Uh, she's amazing. I think we had a great conversation. Um, we both had a lot of experience uh, with working with sexual abuse and trauma, and um, I hope that you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. I love for you to subs uh, subscribe to my podcast on my YouTube channel and connect with me through my website, fujanzain.com or any of my social media. 
for all of you who are um, into uh, self-help books. Please get this book, Life Reset. Um, it is um, it's an awareness integration path to creating the life you want. It takes you through an exercise from all angles of your life so that you can uh, go through journal and um, really um, look at your life and create a fulfilled life for yourself. So I hope that you enjoy that book. We've done a lot of research on this awareness integration and um, every day we're finding um, amazing results on doing um, a, definitely the research on it. So I'm hoping that you will enjoy it again as much as um, everybody's sharing me that they're enjoying and working in their relationship. Without further ado, here is Beverly Engel, and we're going to talk about her latest book, Freedom at Last, Healing the Shame of Childhood Abuse. Here she is. Hello, Beverly. It is so nice to have you, everyone. Beverly Engel, she is the author of Freedom at Last, Healing the Shame of Childhood Sexual Abuse. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Well, um, childhood sexual abuse is um, high on the level of statistics everywhere in the world. And yes. um, I think despite what we have attempted to uh, bring it down um, and and work on it. I think that we still in many, many countries see it as uh, one of the main issues of um, childhood abuse. Um, you've done a beautiful job in your book on looking at different angles of this, um, you know, going through shame and going through experiences, physical, spiritual, emotional, um, and I think it's beautiful for people to know um, the different angles. I think that there's so many variety of experiences that happens depending on how the abuse has happened. Was it prolonged or was it like once? Is it for somebody who is a family member or someone who's not? And there's so many varieties of types of abuses that happens and the experience that happens. The other side of it is that I think people think that if that has happened, you'll never be healed. And where the beauty of your book is, no, there is a path to that. And I've experienced yes. for 30 years of my own experience with clients and my, me, myself being abused from age three to eight, knowing that there is a freedom at last. Uh, yes. So share with me first, what got you to want to write this? Well, I, like you, uh, was a survivor and the survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Um, and I've had lots and lots of therapy mm -hmm. and was able to recover from a lot of it, but not from the shame. I carried the shame. Um, I tended to blame myself. Um, I never told anyone when I was a kid. And when I did tell my mother, she didn't believe me. So I had a lot of repressed anger toward her, actually, that wasn't even aware of. And then I've worked with uh, survivors of childhood sexual abuse for almost 40 years. And so I saw that shame was the biggest issue for them. The shame of blaming themselves, the shame of feeling like they were like permanently defiled, that they would never, never gain their self-respect back, never be seen in a positive way if anybody knew, uh, feeling like they shouldn't have been at that place, they shouldn't have been with that person, they should have told because they found out later that the same person molested lots of other children, so they carry the shame of that. Um, so the shame has seems to be a, the biggest issue, and so I wanted to write about that shame. So when we talk about shame, um... You have exp uh, you have shared uh, the concept of shame as let me see what I got from your book. Um, you talked about shame as painful um, as a painful self-conscious emotion 
typically associated with negative evaluation of self, a desire to withdraw or isolate oneself and feelings of distress, exposure, powerlessness, and worthlessness. Worthless, yes. definitely. Yes. Yes. And, um, and it's been uh, characterized by feeling of self-condemnation and the desire to hide the, you know, looking at yourself as damaged. So you obviously don't want anybody to know. And you're always anxious about somebody like being found out, like no matter how great you turn out to be, you always are flawed inside. And, you know, you're always waiting to, you know, the, the shoe to drop because somebody's definitely going to find out that you're bad. Um, and then obviously this has a lot of ramifications in our life. Uh, right. And, and, uh, so share with us, um, what is your angle from looking at shame and how to heal that, that part of us who goes through that? The biggest part is to stop blaming yourself. And that's really difficult, uh, for lots of reasons. One is, Children, as you know, tend to blame themselves for everything that goes on, you know, especially with their parents or in their family. Uh, so that's one obstacle. The other obstacle is the idea that I shouldn't have been there or I should have said something, like I said, uh, that I should have done something different. Males have a really difficult time with that because, as you know, males all over the world are raised to believe that they're supposed to defend themselves they're not supposed to ever be a victim. They're not supposed to ever let somebody hurt them. And if they do, they feel horrible shame about that. Like I should have fought him off. You know, I should have run away. I should have done something. Um, and to, so for a male to own the fact that there was nothing I could do, I was helpless. That's a horrible feeling for a male in particular to feel. Females don't like to feel helpless either but males certainly don't like to feel helpless and they don't like to feel like they were victimized, you know, all over the world, you know, there's a, there's a hatred toward victims. We're not supposed to be a victim. You know, we're not supposed to let someone do something to us like that. Um, people don't like victims because it reminds them that they could be a victim at any point that they could be in a situation where they're helpless so, you know, we have a whole culture of people believing that, you know, we, we bring bad luck on ourselves, we cause our own problems, you know, it's always our fault if we're victimized, instead of someone having self -com having compassion for us and saying, oh, gee, I'm sorry that happened. Uh, there's more of a tendency to say, well, what could you have done to avoid this? So that feeling of being a victim is, is shaming in itself. Yeah. Uh, so there's the self-blame, there's the shame. Uh, if there was any feeling whatsoever of pleasure, or if a male got an erection or an ejaculation, there's all the more shame because look, I must have wanted it. I must have enjoyed it. They don't understand that the body is created to respond to pleasure. It doesn't matter who's touching us. Um, and, you know, it's very common actually for a victim of sexual abuse to feel terrorized and shame and on the one hand and, and on the other hand feel some pleasure and that's very confusing as you know sexuality is confusing for adults much, much less children and if your first sexual experience is child molestation it can be very very confusing so this feeling of i shouldn't have felt pleasure if i really didn't want it that's really pervasive um so there's all kinds of reasons why there's a lot of shame. There's the humiliation that happens when, when a person's body is violated. When, when we are violated, we feel humiliated by that violation. We've lost control. Somebody else has taken control of us. That's humiliating and shaming. So there's a wide variety of reasons why it's so shaming. Um, another angle that came up for me as you were talking about it is... Um, when there has been a, a, a relationship built, which at one point the person who's being abused is uh, also emotionally connected with the person. Yes. I've had, I've had um, you know, shared, I've had cases or clients who we talked about 
And um, it was a father who for many years had held that person into a space where the person became uh, their new wife. And then the, the, you know, they felt shame and guilt about, um, you know, their mother hating them. They felt shame and guilt um, about staying in that relationship, although there was a part of them that was at that point was conditioned to benefit from that. Um, and they changed the fear of uh, rebelling against this into as if it was their choice, but that, but then they felt shame around the choice that they had made to, to do that. Or there was a um, experience of a person that I um, heard that he um, was molested by his cousin, but because the con continuing place of this experience was a playful concept, although it was clearly because of the age and you know the difference was considered a sexual molestation and abuse. But when the cousin took him to another person who uh, violated him in a harsh way and pretty much raped him. His rage for all of that went toward the person who raped him, but never toward the cousin who um, started this se sexual abuse for a couple of years and right. he was the one who actually took him. It is so complicated. Yes, yes. Uh, sibling incest and sibling abuse is really very common, more so than we know and say an older brother with a younger brother, an older brother with a younger sister. And those relationships are very confusing to the victim because they like their older brother or sister. They're some, the older brother or sister is sometimes in charge of them and they almost see them as a parental figure. So they go along with whatever they're wanting them to do. Uh, and often it starts with a playful kind of a aspect to it. Um, and yet, as the time goes by, they become more and more aware of how they're being used and how they're being abused. But it's very confusing. You know, very few of them will ever really get it that they were actually targeted by their sibling. And sibling abuse can be some of the more violent abuse as time goes by. Often the sibling is taking their rage at their parents out on the younger sibling. So, yes, you're right. It's very confusing. So when someone finally comes to get help, because obviously um, some people have, I've worked with people, Beverly, who uh, they've dormanted these um, experiences and they've shoved it down. And sometimes the first time they have a child, which their child is in the same age, suddenly they get flooded with memories or mm -hmm. when they are in a relationship and, um, you know, they, they really sense that the more they want to get close, all of their um, uh, system says no, and they start pushing back and pushing back, and they come to couples therapy, and slowly but surely, some of these memories show up. So there's yes. definitely a part of us that um, can dissociate from the memories and the experience we've had and push it down. And then it shows up and floods us. And there are other ways of these memories have stayed with us. We've pushed them aside or we've, you know, found different ways of um, handling them. But they're certainly showing up in our lives one way or another every day without us noticing that it is the effect of uh, the childhood sexual drama. And we see that a lot of work with addiction also. We see a lot of that in the traumas that have happened. And then, you know, that the anxiety, the shame just takes us right into using and then, you know, abusing and then becoming dependent on yeah. um, substances. Right, right. Absolutely. Uh, there's all kinds of ways it affects us. Um, and it's very common for victims to to forget about it or to never really trust the memories that come up or to trust the feelings. I encourage clients to start a truth book where they just write down what they do remember or what they do know is true and go back and read that periodically uh, to help them kind of build their memory and trust their memory. Because that's all, almost always a problem too. 
I don't want to accuse somebody of something if it's not true. If my memory is fuzzy, I don't want to accuse somebody. Uh, and we know that children leave their body often when they've been sexually, while they're being sexually abused. So if you're out of your body, you're not going to necessarily remember exactly what happened in your body. Uh, so connecting to your body is an important step. Uh, checking in with your feelings, you know, asking yourself, am I feeling angry, afraid, sad, guilt or shame? Kind of doing that every day to begin to connect with your body, grounding yourself, feeling your feet on the ground, taking deep breaths, clearing your eyes, taking a look around the room and noticing colors and shapes and textures. That will all kind of help bring you to the present. Survivors of sexual abuse are often not in the present at all. They, they are dissociated kind of all the time. It's kind of become a habit uh, or it becomes, they, they dissociate as soon as they get triggered by something and they get triggered often. So they're often not in their body. They're often not in the present. And we can't really trust our memories or trust our feelings unless we are in our body. So I encourage clients to do a lot of grounding become getting in their body, writing down what they do remember, and all those things can help them to trust their memories more. Um, you talked about out-of-body experience. I definitely have had that where I've, you know, kind of gone in the corner of the room and watched the whole thing. Right. And um and a lot of times when this is happening, then people in their own life, as they go into intimate relationships they're not connected with their body or their sexuality and then there's also the aspect of when you're not connected to your body there's a lot of um, um eating disorders or eating unhealthy or eating emotionally um mm -hmm. not necessarily sensing what's right for you know what food are better for your body or not because you're not necessarily in it <laughs> you know right. living right. in it in order right. to to check it out so it's right. as you said, it's so important to come in. I remember the first times I wanted to even get a massage, it was very clear that you're not gonna um, you know touch my body from like up here to down on my feet. And uh, the the massage therapist uh, accidentally just started you know going to my thighs, and I experienced myself out of my body. And then she she checked and she says, "How come your body just went cold?" Your body's cold. It's as if like you're not in it. I said, mm -hmm. you know, you're not in it because mm -hmm. I told you, I told you not to touch my thighs, and you did. Mm -hmm. And it was a time of coming back. It's like it's safe. It's okay to come back to my body and reside in it. Um, yes, to be able to experience. But as you know, and please share more with us in this area that. If you haven't been in it and then you come in it and then there's like this overwhelming experience of lots of emotions that you have no idea what to do with. Because if you haven't been in it for so long, you've been dissociating yourself from emotions. And mm -hmm. then suddenly you sit and then you experience this flood of shame and anxiety mm -hmm. and, and sadness and then rage and all of it. Can you share mm -hmm. a little bit about how to handle these emotions as they show up in our body. Yeah. Well, first of all, we always have to remember to ground ourselves. Feel your feet on the floor. Take a deep breath. Clear your eyes. That will bring you to the present, but it also helps when you're triggered. Okay? It helps you to feel more solid. It helps you to feel in your body. So I always have people ground themselves. And yes, then if they feel like crying, give themselves permission to cry. A lot of people are afraid that if they start crying, they'll never stop, you know, uh, and a lot of times it feels like that. Once they start feeling the pain, they will cry for a long time. But I always say, give yourself permission. These are tears that you've been holding back for years sometimes. Just let them flow. They need to come out. It will be cleansing. It will be healing just to let yourself cry. And if you get afraid, don't, you know, remind yourself there's nothing bad's going to happen. If we cry long enough, we'll start to kind of choke. Some people may even kind of vomit. That's okay. But your body will take care of itself when you cry a lot. Some people just end up being so exhausted they fall asleep. But it's not going to do anything damaging to you to let yourself cry. And let yourself feel angry. If you're angry, 
find a way to get some of that anger out. Kneel down beside your bed and take your fists and hit your mattress. You know, put your head in a pillow and scream really loud. Let that anger out. It's really good to let that anger out. And you have a reason to be angry. Mm -hmm. So I just encourage people. And if you get scared, do the grounding again. Feet on the ground, deep breathing. All That will always help you to come back to the present. It will always help you to, to be in your body and be safe. Um. Freedom at last, everyone. Healing the shame of childhood sexual abuse by Beverly Engel. Um, Beverly, what are your thoughts about um, sharing your experience with family members, sharing your experience with um, even the abuser, um, confronting the abuser? What have your experience have been? I've had a lot of different angles of this which um you know which we could touch but i just was really wanting to know what were your ideas about it yeah i always encourage people to tell the safest person first the safest person might be a, a your best friend it might be your partner but somebody that you know who loves you and you can trust them to just listen um you can always ask them ahead of time i have something to tell you could you please just listen without any comments at first? Um, but choose a person that's safe, that someone you know is compassionate, someone you know who doesn't judge victims. That's really important. If you've heard this person say, oh, she acts like a victim, but she's not, she, she chose it, or oh, look at that person crying and having a pity party because they were abused or whatever. That is not the right person to tell, even if it's your best friend, okay? Choose somebody who's compassionate toward victims, ideally somebody who may have been educated a, a little bit about childhood sexual abuse and somebody who understands it. If they were abused themselves, that would be great. So be careful who you choose to tell for the first time. Maybe it's in if you're in a group, maybe it's one of your group members or maybe it's actually in the group. Uh, telling a therapist obviously is a good choice. So. Be careful who you tell the first time. That's really important. Uh, and then once you've had the experience of being validated, of being supported, really being listened to in a compassionate way, then you'll have the courage to maybe go to a family member, okay? Uh, family members can be tricky. They can be, if it's, if, especially if the molester was a family member, they can feel more protective of the perpetrator than they feel toward you. Uh, they may have their reasons why they feel like they have to protect the perpetrator. So choose that person carefully. As far as confronting the actual perpetrator, that should kind of be down the line. Maybe hopefully after you've had some therapy, mm -hmm. practice it at first. Do a, do a, do a kind of an empty chair exercise where you imagine that the perpetrator is sitting across from you. I even encourage people to imagine that the person has a blindfold on and a gag and they're tied up, okay? So they can't hurt you. They can't come at you and grab you. They can't even say anything negative to you. They can't even look at you in a shaming way or attacking way. So you can practice what you're going to say. Practice what you'd like to say. Do that well before you ever go to a perpetrator directly. Uh, and know that going to a perpetrator might feel good to you to, to, to tell them, but nine times out of 10, the perpetrator is not going to admit it. And even if they admit it, they're not going to apologize. They're probably going to blame you. They're probably, I mean, I had a client who actually had a father who said, you know, if you hadn't sat on, and when she was three years old, he molested her. If you hadn't sat on my lap and squirmed around so much, I wouldn't have wanted to touch you like that. So perpetrators are masters at manipulation, at blaming their victims. So, you know, if you really feel like you have to confront your perpetrator, be very, very careful about that because you could be damaged psychologically from that if you're not careful. If you know what you're walking into and you feel strong and you practiced, you know, and you've got somebody who's going to, help you at the other end of the, you know, the situation, some friends standing by or something, but be very careful with that. 
especially in the societies, Beverly, who are very like a social society, social familial society. Yeah, yeah. Um, which uh, incest and um, sexual abuse is is in a high, high ratio. But one thing that I've really noticed is that um, even though at times where the perpetrator might have actually said, you know, yes, I'm sorry, but the backlash that it happens in the whole family system, uh, because sometimes the person has a spouse, they already have children, they all, you know, it's like the shame uh, just uh, has a domino effect because it's not just about the person who was abused. Now the shame is also out for the person who was the abuser. Now the shame is out for the spouse of the abuser, the children of the abuser, everybody. So it has such a domino effect suddenly that unfortunately it hasn't been, you know, some cases they have actually isolated the um, the perpetrator with their family out. Many times they've, uh, in, if if the person who's a perpetrator is a is a powerful head of the family or a powerful person within the family, sometimes you see that uh, the victim and the victim's family are isolated from the whole family. Right, right. And, um, and kind of like shunned out. And you know, there's so many ramifications that happens. And it's really sad because I think, you know, there is a part of us that gets closure by um, hoping um, and, and and going through the process and seeing that somebody has really acknowledged uh, about the impact that they've had in our life. But on the other side, the reality is that sometimes we do get uh, more abused and more, um, you know, shunned away and isolated by that and more victimized by what's happening. Um, so I do agree with you, not only that you be ready, but to really understand and why am I doing this and what the, you know, it's like any other, like a surgery. Why am I doing this? What are the ramifications? Is it worth the percentage that, of you know, or can I do it another way? Can I get completely mm -hmm. another way? And is it necessary to do it that way? And if you, with all of that, say, yes, it's necessary. And I understand what, you know, the ramifications could be. Mm -hmm. you know get the support be with somebody or you know get the support of how you want to do it and you know um then go ahead and do it and then seek support right after also in order because you know to to face whatever the ramifications are right right um what is it that in um in your experience or in in the book that it shares with us about the process of healing that um, you work with your clients. So the first thing you said was, uh, you know, we're, we're going to stop the blaming of self and then work through the shame. Uh, what are the other processes that you recommend and work with? Well, self-compassion is very big. Um, that's really acknowledging your suffering, really, really telling yourself, I really suffered because of this, maybe making a list of all the effects that it had on you and fully acknowledging to yourself how horrible it has been instead of, you know, minimizing it, denying it, really fully saying, no, this really has had a very negative effect on me. And then offering yourself self-compassion. Self-compassion sounds something like, I'm so sorry this happened to you. You know, this was horrible. Uh, this was very painful. It's affected my life tremendously. You know, I didn't deserve this. I didn't deserve to be treated this way. And so there's lots of exercises that can be incorporated in terms of self-compassion. Um, maybe self-forgiveness is important to you because maybe you need to forgive yourself for some of the ways you acted out because of the abuse. It's very, very common for people who were sexually abused um, to victimize other children or reenact it with other children. Uh, it's very, very common um, to, like I think you mentioned, having a child and maybe projecting onto that child some of the fear and concern that you had as a child and maybe being overly protective of your child um, or maybe not being able to fully love your child because you're so damaged and so hurt. 
Um, you mentioned addictions are very, very common. Uh, so coming to self-understanding is another important one, where you really connect the dots between your negative behaviors and the sexual abuse. It's not an excuse. You're not excusing your behavior, but you're connecting the dots and saying, okay, now I understand why I was abusing alcohol or why I was abusing drugs or why I was, you know, became sexually addicted uh, or why I was uh, unable to uh, enjoy sex. You know, there's so many symptoms, but making that under that connection and saying, okay, now I understand. And that there's a phrase that's just beautiful and so healing. It's understandable that I did so-and-so because of the fact that I was sexually abused. Again, it's not excusing your behavior, but it's understanding. And then, then perhaps it's going to the people that you've harmed and asking for forgiveness, um, not making excuses, just letting them know, I know that I, as a mother, I was too strict with you. I was, I wouldn't let you go spend the night with your friends. I wouldn't let you go out. I was so afraid something was gonna happen to you. I'm so sorry. Uh, maybe it's okay to tell your child, an adult child especially, why? But it isn't even necessary. It's just the apology and uh, please forgive me for that. Um, you know, I'm sorry that I was drinking too much. I'm sorry that it damaged our relationship, whether it's a child or your partner. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there with you sexually, that I was so shut down, or I'm sorry that I was promiscuous in, you know, when I was growing up, maybe apologizing even to your parents that I was so promiscuous, that I was breaking the law, that I was always getting into trouble. Uh, and again, being careful to ask yourself, is it necessary to tell them why? Uh, or is it just important to apologize for it? Um, but those are all important to, to have self-understanding and self-forgiveness and self-compassion. Those are all powerful ways to heal yourself. Absolutely. And I think that sometimes also being part of groups, not only the individual therapy, but also part of groups to look at oh, yeah. how uh, all these different types um, of sexual abuse that happens and how it reflects in people's lives in so many ways. Because I think sometimes when there is a there's a trauma at a very early childhood, we take that trauma and then it shows up in a particular way, let's say in our friendships, then in, in a particular way in our intimate relationship, in a particular way in our career or the way that mm -hmm. we have our body or uh, you know, family systems, community. Um, so sometimes when we are in a group and we hear different concepts of, oh, this happened to my life and this is how it um, affected my life, then it becomes a mirror about, oh, how did that affect me in my career? How did that affect me in so many, many, many different layers uh, mm -hmm. of my life that uh, sometimes when we talk about sexual abuse, uh, we imagine it that only affects us in maybe intimate relationship and sexuality, but it can affect you in every realm and every type of relationship that you have. Yes. Yes. You know, we've seen that a lot in um, the work situations, Me Too movement. Many of the people who um, had gone through that is because they also had experienced this as a childhood. So as it was showing up for them, they weren't even realizing that this is not okay to yes. stand. You know, they victimized themselves again and again and again because they thought this is the way it is. Like they would even gravitate toward it or it was normal for them instead of somebody right. saying no from the beginning, the same way if somebody's, you know, abused by their father physically, they might have a higher chance of um, finding a mate who also is abusive to them. Right, so right. Looking at all of these areas that as an adult, it's uh, manifesting itself. And, you know, uh, not only going through the healing of the childhood concept, but also seeing the trace of it, how much it's affecting me in different areas and how to heal that and at least being aware of it so that I can change my behaviors and the way that I approach the world. Absolutely. Uh, that experience of the Me Too movement, movement is really profound because a lot of the victims became frozen when, when they were sexually approached. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that state of being frozen is, is a state of trauma 
it comes from having been traumatized. And I can't tell you how many clients that when I explain, because they would say, I felt like my feet were in cement, I couldn't move. And I explained that, you know, well, that's related to the, the fact that you were sexually abused as a child and you were being re-traumatized and your body had gone into the freeze mode. You know, so just understanding that, that can help them forgive themselves for not being able to be assertive and being able to push the perpetrator away. Yes. And seeing the signs, I think that before it even happens, it is so normal for us that we don't even see the sign until it happens. So right. having the idea of, no, 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 some of these concepts are not appropriate and I should see the signs as not appropriate and not normal. Right, you know? right. And therefore, yeah. I can I can put myself in a position of not allowing to go even that far to, uh, you know, to freeze. So it's right. a very important, again, because of the high statistics that shows us even and yeah. we're talking in countries that do have statistics. There are right. so many places that the structure of creating uh, statistics is not even there. So yeah. we know that the sexual abuse and molestation in any format is uh, it's still happening in a very, very high amount. So yes. uh, educating ourselves about it and educating our children is important. What would be, uh, to complete our conversation, what would be your suggestion for uh, pe you know, parents who are trying to prevent sexual abuse of their children and they're trying to teach their children in how to set boundaries for themselves and, you know, how to be at least whether, you know, they're there with a family setting and, or with a stranger, what would your suggestion be to parents and how to, to share with their children in a way to educate them, to protect themselves? Well, there's so much information on that. And I don't think we have the time to go into the, all of that, but maybe the takeaway is, Encourage your children to trust their emotions. Encourage your children to have their emotions. Don't, don't teach them that if they're angry, they shouldn't express it or not to cry. Don't teach boys to, to not cry. Don't teach girls to not get angry. Teach your children it's okay to cry. It's okay to get angry. It's okay that if you have a feeling in your gut that something's wrong, trust that feeling, okay? And there's tons of books and information on the specifics of what you do to help your child, you know, to avoid being sexually abused. But if you can give your kids permission to have their feelings, I think that's the most important thing. Freedom at Last, Healing the Shame of Childless Sexual Abuse by Beverly Engel. Beverly, anything that we haven't touched upon that you really want everybody to know? Uh, just to be very uh, forgiving of yourself for having shame, for feeling shame about the sexual abuse, but knowing that there are ways to heal that shame so that you don't have to carry that throughout your life. You don't have to carry the burden of shame throughout your life. And how could people find you? Um, I have websites. One is www.beverlyengel.com. -E uh, one is healmyshame.com. <clears throat> And they can contact me through those websites. Beautiful. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with hey, me, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye.